So I'm going to, let me give you just a brief um, uh, outline of my agenda. I'm going to talk about Kierkegaard, uh, what he wrote about tragedy. Then I'm going to say something about what he said about the Bible, whether the Bible is a tragedy, whether there is tragedy in the Bible in the Greek sense. And then finally, I'm going to disagree with Kierkegaard and uh, say what I think about tragedy and the Bible. Søren Kierkegaard is a 19th century Danish philosopher known as the father of existentialism, and he was a very uh, deeply religious Christian. The book I'm going to focus on was, uh, is titled Either Or. It came out in 1843. And the basic idea of the book is it contrasts, juxtaposes two different worldviews, a worldview that Kierkegaard calls aesthetic and one that he calls moral. And uh, tragedy is discussed in the part that's about aesthetics because tragedy is part of the aesthetic worldview. So in this essay that deals with tragedy, uh, Kierkegaard uh, is concerned very much with the difference between ancient Greek tragedy and modern tragedy, such as, for example, what you find in uh, Shakespeare. And he says, it can scarcely have escaped the attention of any observer that there is an essential difference between ancient and modern tragedy. And yet, at the same time, a bit later on, he says, everyone must be gripped by a certain sadness, because no matter how much the world has changed, the idea of the tragic is still essentially unchanged, just as weeping still continues to be equally natural to humankind. So the question then is, what, are, what, uh, what do the differences consist in between modern and ancient tragedy, and what do those uh, differences say about the, the difference between the ancient, ancient worldview and the modern worldview? Uh, and so there, here's another quote from the booklet that you have. A feature in which our age certainly excels that age in Greece is that our age is more depressed and therefore deeper in despair. Thus, our age is sufficiently depressed to know that there's something called responsibility and that this means something. In it, this is a very long quote. I'm going to read it all through once, and then I'm going to go through it sentence by sentence. In ancient tragedy, the action itself has an epic element. It is just as much event as action. This, of course, is because the ancient worldview world did not have subjectivity reflected in itself. Even if the individual moved freely, he nevertheless rested in substantial determinants in the state, the family, and fate. The hero's downfall, therefore, is not a result solely of his action, but is also a suffering Whereas in modern tragedy, the hero stands and falls entirely on his own deeds. So, in ancient tragedy, the action is just as much event as action. Uh, I take it this means that for the, well, for the ancient Greeks, the actions of human beings aren't so different from natural events which are governed by laws of nature. The fact that they, uh, um, you know, we think of our own actions as being uh, determined by intention uh, doesn't actually make them so different from the, our movements so different from the movements of animals or trees or objects. This, of course, is because the ancient world did not have subjectivity reflected in itself. Um, subjectivity reflected in itself is so something that has to do with self-awareness. So Kierkegaard is claiming uh, in ancient Greece, or the, the worldview represented there is one where people don't have true self-awareness. They don't have a sense that they could, in principle, distance themselves from their passions, from their urges, their instincts, by sort of reflecting on them. Even if the individual moved freely, he nevertheless rested in substantial determinants in the state, the family, and fate. So persons, in other words, were thought of as parts of bigger entities like a family, a clan, a culture, a nation, maybe humanity as a whole, uh, and as acting according to the nature of those entities. So although we, you know, they had the experience as we have of uh, being discrete physical entities, they nonetheless weren't regarded as completely free and separate individuals who could go their own way, who could go against their culture, who could uh, have completely different ideas from their family. The hero's downfall, therefore, 
is not a result solely of his action, but is also a suffering. So here we have uh, Oedipus, uh, and as an example, Oedipus kills his father and marries his mother, and this is, in the play, this is represented as the result of fate, uh, which the uh, angry, capricious gods have cursed him with. So he spends his whole life trying to avoid this fate. He has his own intentions about what to do, but in the end it turns out that these intentions aren't what actually drives uh, his life forward. In, in the end, he ends up just fulfilling the destiny that's been determined by someone else. Whereas in modern tragedy, the hero stands and falls entirely on his own deeds. So nowadays, Kierkegaard is claiming, we think that people are responsible for their own actions and that's because they could have always chosen not to do what they did. Um, Oedipus, you know, today would be regarded as, uh, uh, we wouldn't buy the whole thing about fate. We would think, no, you, 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 know, you have to take responsibility for what you did. So an example, Kierkegaard doesn't use this example, but you could give Macbeth as an example, right? He brings, out, he brings about his own ruin through ambition, uh, maybe also through the fault of his wife. And so he's to blame for the murder of Duncan. He's also to blame for the death of uh, Lady Macbeth. So the question is, uh, or one of the big questions of the essay Kierkegaard writes about tragedy is what is lost in, uh, what has modernity lost of value from the ancient worldview? So this is a picture of uh, uh, Oedipus and Antigone. And Kierkegaard writes, um, in the ancient tragic, uh, there is implicit a sadness and a healing that one indeed must not disdain. This is a quote on your hand. Intrinsically, the tragic is infinitely gentle. Aesthetically, it is to human life what divine grace and compassion are. It's even more benign, and therefore I say that it is a motherly love that loves the troubled one. The ethical, on the other hand, is rigorous and hard. So, in ancient Greek tragedy, fate is a source of great suffering uh, to, for example, Oedipus, but at the same time, it's also a source of comfort because the fact that uh, the, the tragic hero knows that he couldn't have done otherwise, he couldn't have prevented uh, the terrible deeds that he committed, he couldn't have not done them, uh, and this, you know, however much uh, sorrow and pain he feels about uh, having killed his father and married his mother, uh, still he doesn't need to feel the same kind of uh, anxiety and guilt and self-loathing uh, that he would have otherwise. So for a modern man, on the other hand, Kierkegaard writes, the power that is the source of the suffering and tragedy has lost its meaning and the spectator shouts, help yourself, and heaven will help you. In other words, the spectator has lost compassion. And he continues, we want to know nothing about the hero's past. We load his whole life upon his shoulders as his own deed, make him accountable for everything. But in so doing, we also transform his aesthetic guilt into ethical guilt. Still, <clears throat> remember, Kierkegaard said, no matter how much the world has changed, the idea of the tragic is still essentially unchanged, just as weeping still continues to be equally natural to humankind. So the question he then poses for himself is, how can uh, modern tragedy become cathartic? How can, how can we um, adapt this genre to uh, the modern audience? so that we can uh, offer them the same kind of soothing sadness that older Greek tragedy provided. And to this end, he sketches, he sort of gives a quick outline of how he would like to uh, adapt Sophocles' Antigone to uh, a modern, the modern context. So he uh, changes the story and yeah, describes this in the book. So here we have uh, Antigone, uh, symbolically uh, th throwing some sand on her dead brother by way of giving him an honorable burial. And this is from, of course, from the ancient original uh, Antigone. And this was the crime for which she was sentenced to be buried alive. So again, in case you didn't know, Antigone is Oedipus' daughter. But in Kierkegaard's modern version of the play, uh, Antigone doesn't face this dilemma of 
of obeying a, a state, state decree on the one hand and being true to family and specifically to uh, the religious uh, ceremony surrounding family relations. The, all the drama, the tragedy, and what Kira calls the tragic collision all take place within her psyche. It's a, an emotional struggle, struggle within her. So the premise of this play is that Oedipus is dead and Antigone is the only one who knows what he did. The only one who knows that he uh, killed his father and married his mother. She dedicates her life to sorrowing over her father's fate, over her own. A calamity such as the one that's befallen her father requires sorrow, and yet there's no one who can sorrow over it since there's no one who knows it. And just as the Greek Antigone cannot bear to have her brother's body thrown away without the last honors, so the modern Antigone feels how harsh it would have been if no one had come to know this. It troubles her that not a tear would have been shed, and she almost thanks the gods because she has been selected as this instrument. She loves her father with all her soul, and this love draws her out of herself into her father's guilt. So in other words, Kierkegaard's idea here seems to be that by loving uh, her father, Antigone is uh, partaking of his sorrow, of the regret he feels about what he did. And in that sense, she is in, in, to some degree at one with him. She, is also, she shares in the responsibility for what he did. So through compassion, her compassion for her father, misfortune and sorrow spread from one person to another. They, they're passed down from parents to children. So in other words, in this modern tragedy of Kierkegaard's, love has taken the place of fate. Characters are compelled by this internal force, the passion of love, to do uh, harm to themselves and to others. And now we come to the Jewish question. One might promptly think, Kierkegaard says at some point, just kind of by the way, one might promptly think that the people who must have developed the profoundly tragic was the Jewish nation. For example, when it is said of Jehovah that he is a jealous God, that he visits the iniquities of the fathers upon the children to the third and fourth generations, or when we hear those terrible curses in the Old Testament, one could easily be tempted to want to seek tragic material here. But, he continues, Judaism is actually too ethically mature for that. Even though they're terrible, the Lord's curses are also righteous punishment. It was not this way in Greece, where the wrath of the gods had no ethical character. So in other words, Kierkegaard is saying the, the Jewish worldview is too moral, in that sense also too modern. Uh, it aims at justice rather than comfort, for example. It regards people as either innocent or guilty, but not something in between. Uh, whereas, and this was a quote that I skipped, uh, Kierkegaard at some point says that tragic guilt is the guilt that vacillates between, uh, or the tragic hero must vacillate between guilt and guiltlessness. There's, uh, the guilt is uh, ambiguous. And so, again, this moral uh, worldview also has no pity uh, for criminals, but only for victims. So, again, you remember Kierkegaard said... Uh, um, that the modern spectator has lost compassion, it wouldn't be able to have compassion for someone like Oedipus. So, for example, we can look at the story of Cain and Abel, although uh, Kierkegaard doesn't mention it. Uh, this is uh, Chagall's version of Cain and Abel. So this is this one example of crime and punishment in Genesis. Uh, and Cain talked with Abel, his brother, and it came to pass when they were in the field that Cain rose up against Abel, his brother, and slew him. And the Lord said unto Cain, Where is Abel your brother? And he said, I don't know. Am I my brother's keeper? And he said, What have you done? The voice of your brother's blood cries unto me from the ground. And now you are cursed from the earth, which has opened her mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. When you till the ground, it will not yield unto you her strength. A fugitive and a vagabond you will be on the earth. So, so far, it's true that there's a terrible punishment uh, for uh, what is really a terrible crime. Um, and yet, I want to, at this point, disagree with Kierkegaard, or to ask at least the question, is it really true in many of the stories in Genesis 
that we want to know nothing about the hero's past. We load his whole life upon his shoulders as his own deed, make him accountable for everything. So uh, if we go back from the passage I just read, right, and we read about uh, the background to this crime, we learn that uh, in the process of time, it came to pass that Cain brought up the fruit of the ground an offering unto the Lord. And Abel, he also brought of the firstlings of his flock and of the fat thereof. And the Lord had respect unto Abel and to his offering, but unto Cain and to his offering he had no respect. And Cain was very wroth, and his countenance fell. First of all, I want to stop and talk about what is really uh, Cain's tragedy here, and aside from the punishment he gets from God. Uh, it's representative, I think, of a, a very uh, large... Uh, source of tragedy in life. So in this example, God appreciated Abel and his work, but not Cain and his. So there's no reason given uh, why uh, Cain's offering was inadequate or not to God's liking. Maybe God just doesn't like vegetables. Maybe he prefers meat. There's also a question, so why did Cain offer uh, vegetables? Well, because that's what he does. That's He is the tiller of the ground. And uh, in even uh, earlier in the story, this is presented as a basic fact about him that probably he had no say in deciding, right? So it's the only thing actually we find out about him, who is uh, Cain, who is the first uh, human being born in the world, not in paradise. And Adam knew Eve, his wife, and she conceived and bare Cain and said, I have gotten a man from the Lord. And she again bare his brother Abel, and Abel was a keeper of sheep, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. And now if we go even further back, we trace the background of uh, Cain's uh, predicament, his situation, the, his punishment, even further back. Uh, we can say that in working the land, Cain is really an heir to his father, uh, Adam, whom God punished in this way for eating the fruit of the tree of knowledge. Right? So uh, this is uh, God's punishment. Uh, Cursed is the ground because of you. Through painful toil you will eat food from it all the days of your life. Uh, it will produce thorns and thistles for you, and you will eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your brow you will eat your food until you return to the ground. Since from it you were taken, for dust you are, and to dust you will return. So this is Kierkegaard again, what he had said about Greek tragedy. He says, what provides a tragic interest in the Greek sense is that Oedipus' sad fate resonates in Antigone's brother's unfortunate death and the sister's conflict with a specific human injunction. It is, as it were, the after pains, Oedipus' tragic fate spreading out into each branch of his family. Now, if we try to apply this to uh, the example that I chose, Cain and Abel, uh, it's clear enough that Cain's predicament is also something like the after pain of his parents' transgression in the Garden of Eden. So he is responsible for uh, his vegetable sacrifice, for his anger, eventually also for the murder of his brother. And yet, we also hear resounding in his fate, in his predicament, the punishment that was meted out to his father, as well as a perennial source of human frustration and grief, which is uh, the fact that we are at the mercy of the taste of others. Now, if we uh, also look at, uh, sorry, at a different story, uh, well, at Adam and Eve's uh, story, I want to uh, point out another, what to me is a, a typically a uh, tragic feature of that story. So it's not just a matter of uh, how their, uh, their expulsion from Eden comes about, but it's about how the Bible uh, uh, presents their, uh, their explanation for what they did. Right? So Adam's explana uh, explanation we have here, the man, Adam, said uh, to God, um, the woman you gave to be with me, she gave me some fruit from the tree, and I ate it. And the woman said, well, the serpent tempted me, and I ate. Uh, and there's this uh, sort of uh, innocence here that I think is uh, childish, 
uh, well, childlike, but not uh, stupid. In other words, I think it's uh, they they come across as having as having acted, you know, in good faith, as being essentially innocent, and especially I think uh, Eve's uh, Eve the, the simple sentence, "The serpent tempted me, and I ate." Uh, has something uh, disarming about it. Uh, finally, and one more uh, ty typically uh, tragical characteristic in the Bible, I want to illustrate with the story of uh, Jacob and uh, Esau. So they're brothers. Uh, so it says, now Jacob cooked a stew and Esau came in from the field and he was wary. And Esau said to Jacob, please feed me with that same red stew, for I am weary. Therefore his name was called Adom. But Jacob said, sell me your birthright as of this day. And Esau said, look, I'm about to die, so what is this birthright to me? Then Jacob said, swear to me as of this day. So he swore to him and sold his birthright to Jacob. Now in principle, this story should end here. We've been told everything um, about this part of their lives, this, this uh, part of the narrative is complete as it stands here. And yet it continues, uh, it continues by giving the details, by sort of spelling out as if in slow motion, uh, the last uh, step of the story, right? It says something like, and Jacob gave Esau bread and lentil stew, and he ate, and he drank, and he rose, and he left, and he didn't care about his birthright. So we have this minimally descriptive list of banal, everyday actions, eating, drinking, uh, rising, and leaving. Uh, there's the simple, repetitive rhythm. And precisely in this, uh, in this stylistic way, what's conveyed isn't, is, uh, the, the swiftness, the ease with which a person can give up uh, something good that they have, uh, the, the swiftness by which someone can undermine himself and bring about his own ruin. It also highlights the disproportion of these banal actions, eating, drinking, and so on, on the one hand, and their momentous consequences, their sort of disastrous uh, consequences. So in other words, if there's, uh, well, the, the, the distinctly um, the distinctly tragic uh, characteristic here, and even the, the it contains a kind of uh, theory about uh, the tragedy of human life, namely that tragedy is something pervasive in human life and even something banal. It comes about in a completely banal and ordinary way. <laughs> 